uh, our panel um, and with the program for this morning. Um, in addition to welcome you and thanking you all for joining us today, I also wanted to explain how our webinar is going to work out. Uh, we ask that all of you um, um, both mute yourselves and turn off your cameras so that all of our undivided attention can go to our panelists. Um, so that's uh, please very important. And also we invite you to utilize the chat function to share your questions. That's um, as well very important. The good news in a webinar like this is that you don't need to wait until the end for your questions, you could type them as they, as they come to you um, during the different uh, remarks that we will be hearing this um, um, during, during our program today. So we have a stellar um, uh, list of panelists. Uh, we will begin with uh, Hilji Van Land, who is secretary uh, General of the International Association of Universities. And after her opening uh, and welcoming remarks, we will move on to our panel. Uh, we have three experts uh, on today's topic. We are joined by Ibrahim Oanda, um, who is Senior Program Officer and Head at the Council for the Development of Social Science Research in Africa. We are also joined by Professor Jeroen Husman, who serves as editor of Higher Education Policy. As well, we are joined by William Breitner, who is journals publisher at Johns Hopkins University Press. So as you can see from our three panelists, we will be getting um, different perspectives on current issues about changing dynamics in academic publishing. So with that in mind, um, it is my pleasure to welcome Hilji Van Land, who is Secretary General of the International Association of Universities. Thank you very much, uh, Gerardo Blanco, for uh, this opening. And um, I am very pleased to be here today with all of you. I see we have more than hundred and uh, more than hundred participants already coming to uh, to the room. Um, so a very warm welcome to all for this very exciting uh, session coming up. Uh, this is a joint webinar between the Boston College Center for International Higher Education and the International Association of Universities, something that we are now very confident to do on a regular basis. And we're very pleased with that because it's a beautiful uh, partnership and cooperation between the two uh, across, um, across the Atlantic. Uh, and very pleased to see people coming in from all parts of the world on this very important topic, changing dynamics in academic publishing. I'm sure that the three speakers from Europe and a colleague of ours, Jeroen Huismann, who is the editor as well of the IAU um, peer reviewed journal, Higher Education Policy and from the US and from Africa, three esteemed speakers with different points of view on these changes that will impact the future of higher education research, but also the future of the impact of higher education research and um, hopefully, for a, a better impact for social impact of the research outcomes. So we're very pleased to work together uh, and Gerardo Blanco, this will be our first webinar together and uh, very pleased um, to, to, to do that today. And also together with Giorgio Marinoni, who is uh, the manager internationalization at the IAU for the Q&A uh, towards the end of the session. We hope we will have many of your questions uh, because this is a topic that really may shape the future in a different way um, in, in the years to come, as we will see how um, uh, published in the publishing world will allow more to come in, more voices to be heard, more connections between um, research communities or research um, perspectives. And that is what is obviously hoped also uh, through debating this today. 
This uh, webinar also forms part of um, two webinar series, one of the Boston College um, Council on International Higher Education, and the other series is the IAU webinar series debating the future of higher education. And we have more than 25 sessions in that series also available for you to watch and, and watch again if you wish uh, online on Twitter. And I know that the CIAG webinars as well are available. So the series will continue into the future on both sides, and you will hear about uh, future sessions of the of the uh, CIHE as well. On IAU sides, we have maybe two that would be of interest also in the context of our discussion today. One will be on leadership and uh, what makes for a good university is the title. So how do we ensure that good and quality higher education is ensured for the future? And that will be uh, debated on 13 April. And later we will look at open science again from uh, a slightly different per but complementary perspective to the debates today. As the IAU in its magazine has called for papers from around the world to look at open science and how um, open science, open access, all the different forms and shapes will also shape the future of higher education. And we've received some 30 papers that we will present um, in that webinar to come. So please stay tuned to what is coming up on both sides at Boston College on their website and on the IU website. Plenty of opportunities to engage and to uh, debate uh, future perspectives on higher education. So the floor is back to you, uh, Gerardo. Thank you very much for that uh, conversation framing our panel for today. So we thank you very much. And now uh, we will um, invite our colleague Ibrahim Oanda from the Council for the Development of Social Science Research in Africa to uh, present some opening remarks. Unfortunately, uh, his video is not on, so I will be putting up our, our PowerPoint again. But in the meantime, Ibrahim, welcome and thank you for joining us. Uh, uh, thanks, Branko. Thanks, participants. Uh, my name is Ibrahim Oanda. I'm speaking from, uh, from Dakar. Uh, I work for the Council for the Development of Social Science Research uh, in Africa. Uh, I'm not directly, uh, you know, uh, participating in our publication in portfolio. I had a training and a grants program, uh, but occasionally oversee uh, the publication process of the Council. And I think that uh, uh, I'm very, very informed to make some remarks about uh, the kind of changes uh, that we are witnessing. Now, the council was established in, uh, in uh, 1973. And the part of the reason that it was established uh, was try and give a voice to African academics, uh, put in terms of their research work and in terms of their publications. Uh, if you walk through the council documents, then you will see how uh, serious the whole issue of trying to give African academics a voice, a platform uh, on where to publish their work, uh, you know, is. And that essentially means that in terms of our project, our work, uh, we have uh, privileged uh, African voices in terms of uh, the work that we publish. Uh, and, the, and, and that is the process through which we, uh, we take manuscripts, the work that is submitted to us uh, from our research programs, from our training programs, uh, but also from uh, academics who submit manuscripts to us, uh, is such that we, we, we do not reject work just because we think it's not, uh, uh, it's not up to the quality expected. Uh, but we take it as our responsibility to work through, uh, you know, to make sure that the authors finally get published because we consider this to be part of a major problem that was uh, uh, facing African academics. We still think that it is a major problem and we still continue grappling the whole issue of how we uh, have to uh, create the better, better platforms uh, for African researchers, especially the young generation of academics who are coming through 
uh, uh, their work published and disseminated to a wider audience throughout Africa uh, and outside the continent. That means uh, first that, uh, you know, in terms of our dissemination uh, approach, approaches, uh, we have over time, uh, you know, uh, adopted uh, a, a policy of freely uh, making our applications available for download uh, throughout Africa and elsewhere. Even before people started speaking about uh, open access, uh, you know, our publications were, uh, uh, you know, freely available for, for download, you know, students, academics will do that. And during days when postage was, uh, was possible, uh, every other publication that the council produced uh, was, uh, was mailed to uh, libraries and research centers throughout the continent. We not only do that, but we try as much as possible to utilize digital uh, means to make sure that uh, the publications reach uh, uh, the intended audiences. Uh, that does not mean that we have not been uh, affected by the changes that are taking place within, uh, you know, the publication carriages that uh, uh, that we are witnessing. Uh, within the continent, I think it started even before people started talking about open learning. Uh, the higher education climate within the continent changed, and uh, one of the casualties were the publication houses that were institutional based. Very few universities in the continent these days uh, large successful publishing uh, publishing uh, houses or publishing outfits. In fact, I think other than a few universities uh, in North Africa and the majority of the universities in South Africa, across the continent, we have institutions, higher education institutions that do not have any publishing houses. And, uh, that means, therefore, that the demand for uh, published work within the continent and the demand for uh, platforms uh, uh, through which academics can publish their work is huge throughout the continent. And uh, this is the concern we have uh, in terms of what is uh, you know, currently happening, specifically uh, what open access uh, platforms mean uh, for knowledge production in the continent and, uh, and the kind of knowledge that uh, both students and academics access uh, throughout the continent. Uh, in terms of the current challenges, and I'm not going to speak so much about, you know, what open access has done or not done. Uh, I essentially think that uh, if uh, we have to uh, start discussing on how open access, uh, in world direction of open access uh, has changed publishing environments uh, in the continent. We first of all have to think about what kind of promises, uh, what kind of, uh, of, of targets uh, open access, uh, uh, you know, uh, promise to meet and what kind of challenges uh, different regions face in terms of uh, knowledge production and, its, uh, and its submission. Now, in the continent, access knowledge was just part of, a small part of the problem as I've, as I've mentioned. Uh, a huge part of the problem was that academics who are not getting platforms uh, through which uh, their work could be published. Uh, this has been much documented about, you know, uh, uh, the rejection rates of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of hard course exam from, from the continent. Uh, and the fact that it was failed, that it's not because uh, the, the articles that are submitted from the continent uh, were of poor quality, but because of certain gatekeeping practices uh, that academics from the continent were not uh, able to, uh, to overcome. The very idea that we could have an institution like Cotesria uh, was therefore made to overcome this challenge. And we think uh, that uh, as much as current, uh, you know, uh, publishing practices uh, have made access to knowledge uh, a little bit more easier, it has not essentially made it uh, democratized uh, or made available uh, platforms through which academics from Africa are able to publish their work. And this is the challenge that we are working. Uh, we have a sense that uh, the, 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 
the publishing dynamics that are, that are coming on board uh, are actually deepening a crisis, at least as far as this region is concerned, uh, that they are deepening a crisis in a number of, in a number of ways. And I'm trying, I will just try to flag four uh, trends that I think uh, are of concern to us. And this does not mean, uh, this does not mean that, uh, you know, uh, there are no benefits that are being realized from open access and associated developments in the publication uh, processes, uh, but that we are more interested to look at what the problems are, what ads need to be addressed if access uh, to knowledge needs to be democratized. Uh, the first one, as I've mentioned, is a uh, concern that, uh, you know, uh, the publishing houses within universities uh, are corrupted. And open access has actually uh, made the case, uh, you know, for uh, reactivating these publishing houses even more difficult. Uh, when you uh, make it easier uh, for people to get knowledge, uh, uh, you know, uh, to access uh, published work elsewhere, it even makes it difficult for institutions that are uh, financially struggling to start thinking of, uh, you know, focusing on uh, reactivating their publication, uh, publishing houses uh, that are, are, are already uh, corrupted. And I, I, when you pass through the continent, as we do, facing universities and all that kind of stuff, uh, then you have a sense that academics need their publishing houses, uh, but they kind of, uh, you know, uh, governance structures that we have in the institutions uh, are no longer taking this as, uh, as anything that, that, that is important. So uh, we are in a situation where uh, we have standalone universities, teaching universities, people talking about research and the knowledge production, but not having sufficient outlets through which uh, to publish their work, through which to, uh, you know, uh, to, to have their ideas, uh, to have their ideas known. And this idea that therefore means uh, that in terms of uh, influencing direct your discussions, uh, Africa as a region as this has been documented, uh, open access would make it a little bit more difficult uh, for ideas from Africa uh, to get around. Uh, if you don't publish, if you don't, don't have enough infrastructures, adequate infrastructures for submitting your work, uh, then nobody will know what you are doing. But at the same time, we are confronted with publishing cultures that make it easier, a little bit easier uh, for you to access uh, what other people are doing. And uh, in that kind of situation, the temptation is uh, you may, uh, the temptation is that you will take what you are reading, what is easier available to you uh, to be what's normal. Uh, but that may not always be the case. We have a situation in the universities uh, where there is publication cultures that have come, digitization and all that kind of stuff, uh, coupled with the increasing pressures for academics to publish in the absence of adequate publication outreach. Uh, we have a situation throughout the continent uh, where academics have been uh, captured uh, by, by the pay to publish, uh, you know, publication outreach. There is nothing bad with that, but that at the end of the day, when you look at what these outreaches are, then you start raising issues of uh, the court of work that is being published and the court of publication processes. Uh, you know, uh, the quality of time that is important to make sure that the publication meets certain uh, standards. Uh, we see a trend where academics in the continent uh, are actually facing two trends. One is an increased uh, culture of intellectual dependence. If you wanted to do what you call to work, then you will have to depend on work that is published elsewhere. But on the other side, if you wanted to be promoted, uh, then you have to get money and pay to uh, this pay for publication outlets, which may uh, publish your work, but nobody else will know about this work, just in somewhere you get promoted, you search by the metrics, uh, so to say. If you look at the seminal work that has been done by Mouton in South Africa, the 2017 work, 
where even within South Africa, it points out that most of the academics, uh, most of the channels uh, that academics are publishing in, and those that can be uh, taken as a of channels. Uh, therefore means uh, that uh, academics within the continent are with a huge challenge. On the one hand, they have to make sure that they don't become directly dependent on knowledge that is produced elsewhere. Uh, the idea behind people searching and producing knowledge is not that that knowledge is accessed as an end in itself, but that that knowledge remains relevant uh, to the ontological realities where these uh, academics work, to the studies, uh, where the universities are located and all that kind of thing. And I don't think that you know, uh, open access and the attendant developments are sufficiently meeting this kind of challenge. But on the other hand, because the academics need to be, uh, to be promoted and ranked, you know, the new courage of metrics, uh, then uh, we find it's becoming not only expensive, but expensive, uh, but at the same time, publishing their work in outreach that is not to give them, uh, that is not to give them any kind of, uh, of visibility. Uh, uh, thirdly, is what we see as a challenge of uh, universities, and this could be happening elsewhere. Uh, but universities, universities ceding the power to control knowledge production and examination to corporate entities uh, outside the universities. What does it mean if the big publication houses come together? And they start signing contracts like the University of California, California did recently. Uh, start signing contracts with universities that have money, uh, you know, to determine the kind of knowledge that uh, you know are going to be accessed by the universities. But the universities within the universities, those kind of infrastructures are not there. It means we are moving them out of the universities and then, you know, ceding that responsibility to entities outside the university, the corporate entities out of the universities to manage the process of knowledge production. Uh, we may try as academics to control what we are doing in terms of the content, but I think that we will, at the end of the day, lose about 50% of what really, uh, you know, at the, at the end of the day accounts as uh, 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 direct sovereignty uh, in, the, in the kind of work that we are doing and the, and the, and and, 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 the and lastly, uh, uh, just before I, I I yield this ground to my colleagues, is uh, what I see as the emergence of new practices of gatekeeping uh, in the terms of publication cultures again, uh, which is disempowering the academics. Uh, you know, if you you say that we are going to publish your work without uh, the academics and the discipline associations having uh, more ground to determine about the peer review processes. Uh, but we have this one being determined by the commercial big publishing houses who so they decide to peer review your work and all that kind of stuff. I know in our practices, we have been approached by publishing houses. Can you help us review this work? This never used to be the case before. Uh, academics and disciplinary associations could take, uh, you know, uh, prominence in terms of how review work was organized and who was going to review what, uh, and, and, and how important in that case was uh, was assured. But I think that we are yielding this ground to uh, to a new uh, generation of irritating practices in, in the production and examination of academic knowledge in a way that it is about the academic and the higher education institutions in the process of college. And I think these challenges are more, sitting from where I am, uh, the challenges are more uh, within, uh, within the continent, given that before these new barriers came in, uh, the continent was already struggling because of uh, certain other factors that are external factors that, 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 that I've already mentioned that I think we continue struggling. As for this, these are the issues that we continue struggling, the, you know, the, the submissions that we get from a younger generation of, of academics, the evidence that uh, you know uh, this work has weaknesses, uh, but the reality that you know uh, the higher education institutions did not have capacities to meet the kind of challenges that we are seeing, and at the end of the day, the young academics are going to be captured by different external interests in ways that does not privilege academic production in the continent. For me, it remain very critical challenges. I'll stop here and uh, yield to my colleagues. 
Thank you very much for that overview of the challenges, particularly uh, for sharing your perspective about the challenges that uh, many academics in Africa are, are facing in this uh, changing, uh, changing dynamics. Thank you very much. And now it's my pleasure to invite Professor uh, Jeroen Husman um, uh, to, to speak to us. Please, Jeroen. Thank you very much, Hello. Um, and thanks to the center and the IEU for organizing this uh, webinar. Um, pleased to join you and to speak from the journalist's perspective. Um, basically, uh, two topics that I would like to address. We can talk about many things that I've selected two issues. Uh, one is to give you an overall trend of how I see the field developing in terms of journals and submissions and the like. And the second topic I would like to address is our current understanding of how we should move forward. I do see some notes in the link that um, connection is not so good. Your uh, own, yes. Uh, I don't know if it's a problem with the connection or if you have uh, a microphone connected. It could be either one of them. So I don't know if by any chance you may have headphones that you could connect to the computer sometimes that fixes it, or it could be just a problem with the connection. Um, I wonder if what we can do is, um, since we are having problems hearing you, if we could move on to uh, William next, uh, while we give you a moment to see uh, if you could uh, connect a microphone or if there's a problem with that, uh, or if you could try to reconnect to the call. Sometimes that helps, but not always. Uh, would that be okay, Jeroen? That's good, of course. Thank okay, you. excellent. So, uh, so we, uh, you know, we can try to have you uh, solve um, a bit of this uh, troubleshooting that needs to happen. But uh, Bill, I wonder um, if, if, if you are ready, we would love to go uh, next to you. It is my pleasure then to introduce William Breitner, who is journals publisher at Johns Hopkins uh, University Press. So welcome, Bill. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I hope my sound's okay. You can hear. Um, Thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, I'm going to give you some um, perspectives, uh, but first, you know, some caveats. We're a university press publisher, um, uh, and in the world of scholarly publishing, um, a relatively small one. We're not an STM publisher. STM stands for Science Technical Medical. Um, that type of publishing is dominated by the very large publishing houses, the Taylor and Francis's of the world, Elsevier, Springer, science, those large, large publishers. Um, our program is large for a university press. We, have a, we publish 100 journals, 100 journals. We're also the home of Project News, which is a bundled collection of, of primarily humanities and social science journals. Um, and that is one of the distinctions of our program that is probably a little different than a, a typical commercial press. Our program is almost exclusively humanities and soft social sciences. Um, we have a connection with the uh, Center for Institute for Higher Education. Um, we also have a, a background with uh, Boston College. We, we publish the journal Reviews in Higher Education, which Phil Altback, who was, um, unfortunately isn't on this webinar, was the editor of. So we go back a long way um, in, this, in this area of publishing. Uh, even though we are different than STM publishers in the sense that in terms of magnitude and in terms of financial power or ability or sustainability, we're still asked to provide many of the same services. Um, and also we're sort of lumped in with the same sort of rules that some of these other publishers that are much more resourced um, are expected to, to adhere to and provide. So it is a big challenge for us in the sense that we need to provide increasing tools and resources for both authors and, and editors so that they can publish um, and the definition of publishing changes also um, year to year. Discoverability is a huge aspect of digital publishing that um, if, if you're not discoverable, if you don't have, uh, if you're not in Google Scholar or some of these other indices, then your content is 
is primarily sort of invisible and doesn't have the impact. And that's, that is why you're, you're contributing. Um, you're contributing because you want to have impact and you want to have um, your research um, followed and uh, recognized. So a big part of what a publisher does is provide that discoverability and enable that access. Open access is not a new, obviously not a new concept. The first Berlin Declaration was, I think, produced something almost 20 years ago. The definition of open access has changed over the years. Um, there are numerous definitions. So that, that is one of the challenges is to figure out what definition is a Budapest initiative. There's a Ghent, there's um, the um, director of, of, of open access journals, there's Spark, there's all these organizations Welcome Trust. There's all these organizations that that put their own sort of uh, definition on what open access is. Um, also, the, the shifting of open access fun, funding has changed from an APC model, which is the author paid model, which is inherently, I think, unfair um, and unequal. It creates uh, unequal, uh, you know, um, outcomes to more of a uh, funder based that what Coalition S and, and, and Plan S are doing. Um, and there's also other new models such as subscribe to open, there's publish and read, read and publish. So there's all these experiments happening out there to try to provide uh, a sustainability and access to content. That's important for us because we're not part, again, we're not part of that ecosystem that the commercial STM publishers have been able to um, here, uh, able to access for many years. Most of the authors of our journal articles are single authored. Uh, many of the, of the content that is published doesn't have any kind of research funding behind it. Um, in our type of publishing, the monograph and the book is still the predominant container for that content. So the natural financial ecosystems or the ecosystems that have developed over the last 15 years to support more open access publishing haven't always been um, available to us. So fast forward to um, 2020. Uh, we, like almost every other program, um, were subject to some really strong headwinds. We are still a subscription-based model. We sell most of our um, content through subscriptions to libraries, either as a single title subscription or as a bundled collection in, in, in Project Muse. Um, but our predictions and our estimates were that we were going to see relatively large declines in funding, 20% or more in terms of subscription funding. And again, already we don't have that natural ecosystem where we can tap into, um, you know, we can't, we, we haven't entered any publish and read and read and publish initiatives. We're not large enough. We don't have a, a, enough journals. We don't have enough uh, resources to go out and negotiate these arrangements. What, what our approach has been to be very fair in our pricing, to give very liberal, what we hope are progressive and liberal policies to allow authors to reuse their content, to post it in institutional repositories or in other kinds of open access repositories. We try to address it in that way. Um, but at the same time, what we've seen is that institutional support for journal publishing is continuing to wane. Um, that's not always the case for a journal establishment like reviews. Um, but for the majority of our journals, which are um, editorial based, they, they maybe have a staff of two or three, we need to provide services like anti-plagiarism software. We need, they want to be involved in communities like COPE, which is Committee on Publication Ethics, so CELJ, which is a council of uh, um, editors of learned journals. Um, again, they want to have web-based peer review and submission systems. Uh, uh, a lot of the more sophisticated tools that editors are now expecting, and also authors. I mean, uh, authors want to be able to access a web-based system where they can get some quick answers about their submission. You know, where is that submission? Is it being in a review? Um, will it be accepted within a reasonable amount of time? Um, that is one of the things that's happened during the early days of the pandemic was that decisions for authors were, were longer than expected and communication was longer as editorial offices shifted and had to adapt to working out of basements as I am right now uh, as a publisher of these journals. Um, I will say a little bit more about quickly about uh, equity issues. 
you know, APCs, they're just not, again, there's not a, a reservoir of, of financial funding in our space for APCs, which is why I think you, you do see the, 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 the landscape navigating more toward reshifting the institution or the researching, researching uh, the research funding organization funding these, um, this type of publication. So the challenging for us is to, to prudently morph and move toward a different financial model, which again, helps to provide more equitable outcomes for authors, widens the access, but at the same time, the challenge is to provide um, sustainability, financial sustainability for many of, this, of the smaller, mid-sized journals that we publish. You know, it's interesting, I don't have any, not one journal publisher that we publish has asked us to move their, their journal to an open access model exclusively. Um, so we have some, almost every journal we publish is a hybrid journal, which is we accept both open access and also gated content. But we haven't had any um, journals so far ask us to flip totally to OA, because I think there's a recognition that there's a funding issue there. Um, journals still have to, to pay for managing editors, they still have to pay for copy editing, they still have to pay for services. Um, you know, so, uh, but we are moving and we are trying to move and experiment with models that are, are more adaptable to the changing needs of researchers, of authors, and also to, to recognize that access to content is not equitable. Um, so, in the Muse side, for instance, we, we've, we've had programs to give away a lot of content to make it very affordable to access content. Um, we'll see. I mean, if, if we continue to if we continue to sort of change and morph here. Um, and we, as, as a university press, and again, a relatively small one or a medium sized one, we, we're working very hard to try to understand all the viewpoints, to adapt, to be flexible, um, and also to uh, distinguish what our role is and what value we bring to scholarly publishing and how that might differ from STM or another type of publisher. So um, I appreciate the, the time, the opportunity to speak with you this morning. Thanks very much and um, I look forward to the rest of the conversation. Thank you very much, Bill. We will be returning to you for the Q&A to all of our panelists, of course. And we have back our colleague, Jeroen. So uh, Jeroen, please, and thank you for all your efforts to troubleshoot. We look forward to, to hearing your remarks. Okay, I'm checking with you, Gerardo, do you hear me? We hear you very clearly. Wonderful. Please go ahead. Hey, and I'll tell you something. I can also show the camera. Very good. <laughs> Thanks for your patience. Sorry about the hiccup, but we are here now and it's better, I hope. What I started off with after having thank you for uh, inviting me is to, to say something about uh, the developments in our journals, higher education journals, our field, how is it developing? And the other issue is the models that we are looking for to improve the dissemination of knowledge. And actually these are also the topics that the other speakers touched upon. I will, I will show my perspective. Regarding developments in our field, my experience as a journal editor and as a member of the editorial board of various journals is that we get more and more submissions to our journals. Uh, the journals cope with that by establishing publishers, setting up new journals. Uh, journal editors are a lot of more space, more page budgets in their journals. And in that sense, we are making up for, you know, the high supply of papers that try to find their way into a higher education journal. Still, uh, there is much more supply than demand. If I just can take the example from our journal, but it's not different from many other journals in our field is that on an annual basis, I would receive now 300 to 350 papers. Uh, we have space for about 40 of these papers. You can do the maths. You can calculate what the statistical chances of getting a paper accepted. Is that a problem? Well, yes and no. Uh, but let 
look at the problematic side. The problematic side is, in my view, that there are very good papers appearing. Uh, people dedicate a lot of time to that, try to get it published, but there's simply no space, whereas the quality is there. And uh, that is something we have to find a solution for, because I don't believe that the increased supply of articles suddenly means uh, that the quality went down. Uh, I'll come to two explanations for the increase in publications in a minute. What a journal, a journal editor, reviewers, and the editorial board can do, at least, is first to be as clear as possible in describing what your journal aims to focus on. Second, to be as clear as possible to explain to potential submitters what added value means, what does a paper contribute to the stock of knowledge, how does the journal look at that phenomenon. And the third thing we can do is to be as clear as possible to submitters about their publications, their submissions. We have to be transparent and honest if a paper is not good. We must explain that to submitters. We must direct them to other journals. If we think that quality of the paper is basically OK, but not a good fit with the journal. And indeed, if, it, if the papers are promising, they should be sent out to for review. And then review reports can help the authors to uh, improve their papers. The question is, um, I don't have the answer, but I have two partial answers to that. Why are there so many submissions in our field? Why is this booming? Well, the first explanation, uh, an obvious one probably, is that higher education is a very interesting area to do research on. But that obviously goes for many other topics in the social sciences and any other sciences as well. But there is merit in saying that higher education has gained more and more uh, attention from various scholars, particularly from the disciplinary fields, and from our own community of higher education researchers. And that is partially the explanation, I think, of uh, a higher number of submissions. The other element, and we can't ignore that, I think, is an important one, is that our academic careers are largely dependent on publications. And the infometrics that come along with that. To make a career, you have to publish in the right between brackets journals. You should publish in journals with impact factors. You should publish a lot, all in light of your career advancement. So that, that trigger, that push actually for to higher education researchers, scholars in general, is a, is a tremendous one. And uh, that put a lot of emphasis on publication, 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 and explains to a certain extent the high inflow of papers to all kinds of journals. The question is, is that a good development? Uh, I have my questions around that. But a key question is, do we actually serve those who need knowledge by keeping this system of performance management in place? I have my serious doubts because the nature of a job of publications in journals, in that way, we are adhering to academic rules. We must prove to the journal editor, to the reviewers, that we are adding something to the existing knowledge. But do we take into account the questions of practitioners, policymakers, citizens, etc., in crafting our academic work to a much lesser extent? Because we have to publish in the high rated journals with high impact factors, and we have to focus on our academic contribution and not so much our policy or practitioners' contribution. Okay, so a challenge there. Um, I'll, I'll bridge this to my last topic, and that is to talk a little bit about the current infrastructure we have in place. 
And, and as Bill all already highlighted, in this ecosystem, publishers, the big publishers, play a key role. Whatever we can say about open access or open science, the bottom line still is that the publishers are steering this process. They still control all the journals, most of the journals in our fields. They are open for innovations. They allow for hybrid open access, green open access, gold open access, all kinds of variants. But the bottom line is still that their business model prevails in keeping the system in place. And let me be clear, I'm not blaming the publishers. I just want to highlight that their business model of staying in the market and getting fees through subscriptions, fees through uh, article processing costs, etc., is a legitimate one, but it is not necessarily the one that we researchers, neither citizens, policymakers, and practitioners are waiting for. So acknowledging the good work that the publishers do to help us disseminate our scholarly work, I end up with uh, an open question and I'm inviting actually to rethink the current models that are still very much publisher dominated and to, to reinvent the future, so to say, and think of alternative models of publishing that might be open access, that must be low cost, and that must take care that findings from our research find the way to the persons in need of that knowledge. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jeroen. It's so good to have you back in the call with all the equipment working uh, for the Q&A. So now it is my pleasure to invite our colleague uh, Giorgio Marinoni from the International Association of Universities to facilitate the Q&A. I've been delighted to see such an active chat with many questions coming through. So Giorgio, you uh, will certainly have a very important role um, to, to play in the, in, uh, for the rest of our webinar. Please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Gerardo, and thank you to all the speakers and the participants for being here. Indeed, we have quite uh, some questions coming to our speakers. So without further ado, I would like to start uh, posing some of them. And uh, the first one is specifically for Ibrahim Oanda. And it's a question about what role could Kozria take in supporting and developing new commercial social science publishers based on the African continent, if any role is envisaged by Codesphere. Codesphere, yeah, sorry. Ibrahim, you yeah. might start applying to this question. Uh, thank you. Uh, the council has in the past tried uh, two approaches. Of course, uh, I did start by saying that uh, uh, as a pan-African uh, institution, uh, Codesia supports uh, work uh, by African uh, academics in uh, uh, throughout the continent, no universities. What we have been trying to do in the last three years was try and come up with an African social science index, uh, which could in can index work uh, from African academics, much as uh, you know, the, the web of science and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and the second thing we have done is to, uh, we, we have a repository where we depose work from uh, our research uh, research groups and uh, from the institutes that we have, and uh, it is easily accessible uh, to everybody else. Can Codesria act as a, a nexus for, uh, you know, licensing commercial publishers? Yes and no. Uh, yes, because this has been our ambition. Uh, but the kind of uh, engagements that we want to have with publishers, it's not that uh, which is going to uh, privilege commercial interests of academic interests in the continent. And uh, what we have been struggling with is how strike a balance between what we think are the fair pressing uh, problems that academics in the continent face and uh, the interests of commercial publishers that we think 
uh, are all, not always in, in consonance with, uh, uh, with these interests. We have in the past had a discussion, for example, with the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, uh, wanting to come and try to you know, translate our work and uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we have had engagement with other commercial publishers, but uh, this has not uh, uh, gone very far because we think at the end of the day, they do not represent the kind of, uh, of, of interest that we want to, uh, that we want to promote in as far as, uh, you know, academic work in Africa is concerned. Uh, so yes, we can do it. And we have been the process of trying to do it. Uh, but again, no, because of certain limitations, we have not been able to do as much as we could have wished to do. Thank you very much, Ibrahim, for a very extensive reply. Uh, we, we have some more questions for you uh, from the participants, but of course, we don't want to you to monopolize the discussion. So I would move to a more general question, uh, which uh, it's possible for all three speakers to reply. Uh, and actually, the question uh, comes from Anstevit from uh, Center for International Education of Boston College. And he would like for you to reflect about the role, quality, and, diverse, and diversity of peer reviewers. So what is the function and the role of peer reviewers in, uh, in academic publishing? If you can, the three of you uh, maybe uh, elaborate a bit on, uh, on these points, uh, and we might start uh, to change a bit from, uh, from Yerun, please. Thank you. <clears throat> I, I think the role of uh, a peer reviewer is partly to be uh, a kind of gatekeeper for the journal to take care that quality is at the level as expected for the journal. But another role is as important and that's the developmental role that in reviewing a paper, a reviewer should guide the submitter to a better performance if the reviewer thinks that the paper is not good enough. So it doesn't help that much if a reviewer said, this is not good, this is not good, this is not good. Obviously, the reviewer should take, uh, put on the developmental hat and say, okay, my argument is that the quality of this part is not good enough because I think you have left out important references, blah, 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 etc. You know, to, to, uh, that's just an example of that developmental role. Uh, when Hans asked about quality, yeah, that, that is to me quite often uh, a black hole in the sense that you can't know in advance what the quality of reviewers is. I know a lot of people, I have a broad network, I can rely on that, I can estimate their quality, but sometimes I have to rely on somebody I don't know. Um, there, that is a risk, but if you have two peer reviewers and an editor uh, sharing his her view, I think you can come to a balanced judgment of the, the submission. Diversity is very important, I think, and I always try to bring in a mix of reviewers that come from different angles. I, if the paper is rather policy oriented, I might be tempted to ask somebody from that field, from the policy field. If the paper is on country X, I might invite a country a fellow to judge that paper, but I'd like to balance that with an outsider's view. So, so here regarding the issue of diversity, very important and trying to balance that by taking people who might have different perspectives on the paper. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeroen. Maybe William, you would also like to elaborate a bit on, on this point. Boy, thank you. Um, peer review is critical to us. It defines the journals we publish. Uh, every journal we publish needs to be approved by our faculty editorial board because the Hopkins imprint is, it's how they, that's how they guard the Hopkins imprint. Um, we, it, 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 we won't publish a journal unless there's some level of peer review. Secondly, we want to have that peer review transparent. So on our website for every journal, we've asked every editor to define, clearly define how they um, conduct peer review. So it is, it is really the fundamental principle uh, of, of the scholarly journals we publish. Um, and in the past, and we're, we're guardians of that. We've, we've, we've 
actually changed editorial teams out because in our feelings that they did not really conduct fair peer review um, or transparent peer, peer review. A couple of things quickly about that. Um, there's actually sort of a crisis right now in, in some ways about peer review in the sense that there seems to be a fatigue out there. So a lot of journals, so there is more content being published, okay? Um, there's a lot more content being published because um, you, know, you don't have the constraints of a print journal any longer. Um, you're starting to see more uh, publishing that's outside of the container. Um, you know, it's, it's database publishing to some degree. And we're finding it's difficult at times to find qualified reviewers, peer reviewers, or to find individuals who have the time, the bandwidth to do that. So peer review is critical to the scholarly publishing process in journals and in books. And I, and I think it's really important that publishers and editors in journals find ways to reward peer review. And I also would, would hope that institutions would start to reward their faculty for providing peer review. There has to be some benefit to that. Otherwise the system sort of collapses. So it's, it's very critical. Thank you very much, William, for a very interesting answer to this issue, very important issue of peer review. Uh, I would pose a different question to Ibrahim uh, because you received some very specific to, um, to Africa and also to your role. Uh, and one of them, it's actually, it's a bit connected with, the, with this topic of peer review, but more with the topic of the selection of articles in your journal and the quality. So uh, the question is uh, asking you how you determine the quality uh, of article to be published and if you are in a way um, adopting a particular uh, a aspect and you are kind of um, giving an African flavor to the selection of your article uh, adapting to the, the reality to the African reality or if you are just adopting the same standards that major journals uh, out there are using uh, and also the, the second question, which is a little bit related to this one, and I think you can reply to both of them together, is if you are also adapting your selection criteria uh, depending on the pressure that uh, scholars in Africa have to, pub to publish works. Thanks uh, for replying to this question, Ibrahim. I think I will add this more broadly. Uh, most of the work we publish uh, comes from the research groups that we support and the students whom we bring to our uh, institutes, thematic institutes. Uh, the approach we have to organizing these uh, activities is that we are trying to work this through until it gets to, uh, to publication, uh, publication level. So for example, for our research groups, uh, once we support the research group, we will, uh, uh, you know, uh, we will give that research group one senior academic who will uh, accompany the group all through until uh, they finish and submit their work. We will also bring the research groups together for two methodological workshops, one at the beginning of the research group where we wanted them to uh, broadly conceptualize the research question or questions that they are going to uh, try to answer. And at the end, uh, we bring uh, them to what we call uh, a, a publication and uh, uh, you know, academic dissemination uh, workshop. Again, where we go through uh, uh, all issues to do with the work they have uh, been able to accomplish, uh, what needs to be done for them to revise that work and if it's published and all that kind of stuff. And once they have submitted that work to us, we still send it out uh, to two peer reviewers, friend peer reviewers who make comments and then return it uh, to the researchers or the research group uh, to make final amendments and uh, before we publish it. Uh, and that idea really responds to the model that we have, that we are developing social scientists in Africa, uh, people who are in mass doing social science research and publication uh, within their continent. Uh, the other second approach that we have is to convene people for publication workshops. Those who do not uh, get our research grants, uh, we have regional methodological and publication workshops that we bring people to just try and uh, uh, 
you know, in that time to publication, carriages and all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, uh, once they submit work to us, we still have to get it out to two peer reviewers uh, who will give us an idea uh, if that work is publishable. And if it's not publishable, we have to return it back to the, uh, uh, to the authors to try and improve it before we publish it. Uh, for a long time, we have been trying to stay on with the researchers until they get that work at some level where it can be published. But because of the increasing number of submissions that we have from the research groups and the students who are then our institutes, uh, then we have had uh, in the last two years say, okay, we will take the work up to some level. And if at the third level, the groups are not revising that work to an acceptable standard where we can publish it, uh, then yes, we have the right of first review. So, but we will tell them, okay, this work is okay. We can publish on our web as a, you know, uh, a monograph or a working paper. Uh, but if you get a publication outlet elsewhere, uh, you can uh, publish this work. So the idea is uh, we, we are committed to developing uh, academics who can uh, publish work uh, in irreputable journals, in irreputable outlets uh, throughout the continent. We don't usually get successful in this kind of thing, but up to 78% of the work that we support will end up uh, publishing. it. This obviously means that sometimes work stays, stays a little bit wrong uh, before, before it's published, but we end up publishing it. What are our standards of quality? Our standards of quality start from the time we accept a proposal that it is a good proposal because of the ideas it has. We don't necessarily look at the elegance of language, but that these are really ideas that are relevant to uh, the kind of needs of the continent. Uh, it's a part of what is in our strategic plan. We, uh, we learn a five year strategic cycle for our programs. So people have submitted uh, this proposal to us. It uh, reflects uh, the concerns we have in this strategic planning cycle. Uh, it tries to raise issues that are important uh, to the continent. And uh, these are issues that we can say even external, external academics are trying to understand and therefore we think it's good we develop the capacity within to try and answer these questions so that if there are colleagues from outside they want to come, they rather join us in answering these questions instead of having people come and just pick that and go and publish it uh, elsewhere. So that is our broad approach, uh, you know, to developing standards for publication uh, and examination within the continent. Uh, we don't essentially have a checklist uh, that we use to say, okay, this article is good in this manner, you know, the code is bad, or it doesn't meet uh, the web of science metric, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we just want to do work uh, which is within our, our strategic planning cycle and which we think is uh, prodding, uh, you know, very critical issues within the continent. I hope I've answered uh, uh, most of those questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Ibrahim. I think you, you answered definitely uh, very clearly to the many points posed by your question. And now um, I have another question, which is for all of you, which is a, a kind of a broad question. And you touch upon this issue already in your presentation. We received different questions. I'm, I'm trying to grouping them on, on the issue. And the issue, it's mainly on the valuation of research and the evaluation of academic career. Um, and the link between the evaluation of academic career and publishing. So all the, the aspects related to the impact factor uh, and also let's say the, the dark side of this uh, evaluation method with the creation of predatory journals and, uh, and the increase of the number both of journals but also of uh, articles which was touched upon in the presentation by Yerun. So um, the idea of open science it's also to increase the possibility for um, the academic community to have uh, more access to the articles. But on the other end, we assist to something that we assist in, uh, in different fields. Also this uh, increasing amount of information available and also increasing uh, amount of, of journals and opportunity to publish. So uh, what is in your opinion, uh, the future adding to and uh, how important is nowadays for a young scholar to be able to, to live in this kind of world where uh, academic publishing is still 
probably the most important way for his, uh, his moving on in his career uh, and how open, open access and open science can change this or what is needed from the academic community to change this system, uh, which is also criticized because uh, that in, the, in the chat we saw some comments more than questions which were criticizing the kind of monopole that uh, big publishers, and, and you also touched that in, uh, in your presentation, have on publications uh, nowadays. So uh, I know it's a quite a broad topic, but it, it would be uh, nice, especially if in the audience there are some young researchers, uh, to give them uh, a bit of an insight of what kind of world is waiting for them nowadays. Who you want to start, please go ahead. William or Jeroen, because Ibrahim has just put uh, Sure, I mean, I, um, I am concerned about predatory journals. Um, a week doesn't go by, and I mean this, literally, where I don't get emails uh, from prospective authors asking, um, you know, if they can publish in our journal. A lot of times they don't even specify the journal. Uh, they just say, can I publish in your journal? Um, and then they ask how much it costs. Um, we don't charge for that, obviously. And, and in fact, uh, several of our journals have been victimized and authors have been victimized by predatory sites. There's one site that uh, is ex extremely clever um, in, um, it actually, it, it's called University, what is it called? University something, um, University Publishers or something like that, University Press. And they've actually stolen the um, appropriated, I should say, images from, from journals we publish as it covers and, and, and gotten people to submit articles uh, and payments. Um, so that is, a, that is a huge problem that's going to be increasing. And that, I guess, is reflective of, and the, and the scholars and the researchers can speak to this better than I can, it speaks to the pressure to publish. Um, especially in the Near East and other parts of the country where publication is important for advancement. Um, in the US, as I, as I said earlier, in our program, the book is still the coin of the realm in many ways. Um, so, uh, you know, that's another issue altogether in terms of monograph publishing, um, especially, you know, in a world where no one buys monographs necessarily. Um, can that be sustainable? And I, I would just throw out there that it's it's part of another larger discussion about the the, the um, period uh, about um, um, tenure, obviously. I mean, the university press publishing system in the U.S. A lot of it was predicated on, or at least recently, has been predicated on the need for tenure. There has to be venues for scholars to publish their monographs. Um, Hopkins, you, Johns Hopkins requires two monographs. Um, from, from an accredited press to be considered for tenure in some disciplines. Um, so it is an issue. Um, so the issues are, does tenure survive? Um, what about predatory journals? Um, and again, is there, are, there, are there mechanisms for publishing more um, cost effectively, getting access to that content and doing so when we already know that there are some constraints on resources, especially on, as I mentioned earlier, reviewers um, and just, just uh, editorial resources. Thank you very much, William. Uh, Jeroen, would you like to add something on this issue? Yes, yes. Uh, I'll, I'll take another slightly other perspective. I, I appreciate what Bill said, and I do agree. I, I think there's work to be done by two important stakeholders. Uh, one is the academic community itself. I think we, as a, as a strong group of uh, highly trained professionals, should try to step away from only focusing on these performance indicators like journal impact factors, citations, etc. I'm not saying that they are totally, totally meaningless, but they only tell you a part of the story. And, and that brings me, so, so I think the academic community should stand up and tell that story that it's not only about numbers of citations of your work uh, and that there are other impacts of your work that are as valuable. And that is my bridge to say that here is clearly a task for all our universities across the globe to also put critical questions forward towards this metrics approach, 
because the universities are there indeed to advance knowledge and publications in peer-reviewed journals definitely contribute to that. That is a very important thing, but there are so many other ways to disseminate important knowledge that we discover, and that should be appreciated by the universities. So the universities should open up and in their human resource management strategies and in their career advancement of their scholars also make space for other contributions. Writing a proper policy report for a government, writing a guideline for practitioners on the basis of your research. These things are now put away as other publications, whereas I would argue that they are so essential for knowledge dissemination and new knowledge generation that they should be taken on board in career advancement processes and human resource management practices. Thank you, Rerun. Very, very clear yeah. point and much appreciated. Ibrahim, would you like to... Yeah. Let me can say one thing. Uh, yeah, you sure. know, Go ahead. My sense is that, uh, you know, publication cultures are changing, not because uh, the academic world needed them to change, but it's because, uh, you know, business models of publishing change. It is uh, a reality that is being imposed from uh, outside the, uh, the academic world. And uh, if it continues like this, then we risk, uh, you know, getting people into a situation where good academic work uh, is being lost, uh, you know, in, uh, in preference for, you know, work that satisfies metrics. Uh, I've, uh, I've, I've of looking at, uh, you know, work done by colleagues across the continent. And just because they just have to tick the box and, you know, say, we have published 10 articles and we needed to be promoted. And the fact that a lot of universities across the continent do not have adequate internal mechanisms to, uh, you know, uh, know which work is created and which one is not, uh, we have ended up in a situation where we have a cadre of senior academics, uh, you know, uh, you know, whose work is not really grounded in, 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 in any good thinking about, about the issues we are doing. I guess, you know, there is a time that, uh, you know, you will find a senior professor in the university who has stayed for a long time and had taught, you know, uh, just than one book, which is cited over and over again. Uh, these days, you will find a professor who has written, written 10, 20 papers, uh, which are maybe cited once or not cited at all, uh, but that is it. And this is the reality that these are the choices that the American nurse of academics the continent are, uh, are, 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 are facing. I've always argued that uh, if, you, if, you, if you look at the, uh, at the continent, we do not have the luxury of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, if you want to go to America, you will have, uh, you know, academics who are consultants, uh, who, others who are doing basic research, others doing uh, private research. But in Africa, the cohort is so few, such that the same academics who are supposed to be doing everything and still ensure the integrity of the academic, uh, of, of the academic profession. And if we lose them, we lose track by focusing on metrics. And then I think uh, we are going to end up in a situation where good academic work will be also come by the continent. Thank you. Th thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Gerardo. Do we have time for another question, or should we move for a last round of comments? I close? think let's do one more question, and then um, I, I, I think that would be really quite beneficial. And then we will do a round of, of closing comments. Thank you, Georgia. Okay. Yeah. The last the last question is uh, again something related to uh, equity and uh, equity to access in, in publication. Uh, and in a way, I mean, I'm interpreting the question received and it's not exactly like that, but uh, in a sense, um, how can we in a way increase the possibilities for researchers who have less means that if I understood well, what was the question? Like uh, it's not enough to uh, have uh, the same starting point because the starting point are different in reality. So, I mean, open access in a way, uh, open possibility of publishing, it's not really equal because the starting point is not equal. So are there any means to, in, to help uh, 
scholars based in uh, um, unfavorable condition with less resources in a way uh, to publish their uh, research outcomes. Anyone who wants to comment on this? I'm happy to, uh, to respond to that or to, to kick off. Um, it, it's a good question. It's a great question, but it's, it's a challenge. And I'm, I'm responding from the perspective of a journal editor where you actually are a stakeholder in the middle of the process because I don't know when a paper is submitted to my journal or if I'm a reviewer, how much blood, sweat and tears went in the process of making that contribution. So, so in, to a large extent, as an editor, I, I don't have insight in the equity or the inequity aspects of this whole process. What, what I try to do as best as I can as an editor is actually not to look first at who submitted the paper and where is he or she coming from, but just start reading the paper with the abstract and then the paper. And of course, the contents of the paper discloses quite often where the researcher is coming from, because the researcher is quite often writing about his or her own country. But I think that's, that's one small contribution that I can make as an editor to, to give everybody equal chances at the stage of submissions of a paper. Other issues that should be solved in the pipeline earlier are more on uh, the plate of governments and research councils and universities, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Jeroen. Uh, we might have some time for another reaction. William or Ibrahim? I think uh, from where I say it, it's, it's a very difficult thing to do. As I tried to explain earlier, our approach to this work is that we start by, you know, training uh, young academics, the emerging academics, uh, and uh, we make sure that we have some kind of equity in terms of uh, gender, in terms of the region where the people we give research grants are coming from. But as much as possible when it gets to the publication process, uh, we try to give preference to submissions by younger researchers as compared to all academics who are already well grounded in publishing and all that, because we believe that the young academics are the ones who, uh, you know, are struggling to find publication outreach. Uh, and they may not have the kind of support that senior academics have. That's the ritual we try to, you know, uh, to give equity in terms of uh, supporting young academics who are coming up in the continent. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just add, I think, I think most editors, as, as has already been stated, actually do begin the discussion with the content. Um, and they try to make it as anonymous as possible and as fair as possible. I think in, in some disciplines, I think a, some of the equity issues have to come from the disciplines themselves, very far down the origin story here. So for instance, um, there are some disciplines like classics or physics that, you know, uh, classics expression, there's been a lot of discussion about, um, you know, creating some sense of diversity in, in, that, in that discipline. So I think some of these outcomes need to be addressed by the associations or the disciplines themselves. Um, because I, I do think the further up the chain you go, um, the more dispassionate the process is designed to be. Thank you very much. Uh, I see the discussion is going on in the chat, but I think probably it's time to move to a closure. So I give back the, the floor to Gerardo. Thank you very much to all speakers and participants for the question and answer session. Okay. Thank you, Giorgio, for doing what is likely the hardest uh, role in a webinar like this, which is selecting uh, a set of questions to address in, you know, uh, when there is such abundance of good ideas. Uh, and as you said, the, the chat has been very active. I would like to invite uh, our, our three panelists for a round of brief closing remarks. And maybe we can, uh, we can start with Ibrahim uh, to, to briefly just maybe share some closing reflections. Uh, yes, thanks. 
I think it has been, uh, you know, a very important uh, topic for discussion. Uh, you know, looking at the challenges that we face, and I know most of the people, uh, 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 most of the participants who are the students across the continent, uh, are facing the exactly the, the, the same kind of challenges that uh, that I've been trying to point out here. We try as much as possible to link with the universities, uh, but the universities throughout the continent uh, are facing, uh, you know, serious challenges of resources. So any intervention that comes to the universities as individual institutions is likely to be, uh, you know, an external intervention, which ideally means that the university and its operations are kind of going to be extroverted in terms of how they do this. Uh, I take the situation of South Africa, which has the most stable universities in the continent, a very robust publishing uh, you know, environment. Uh, but their scientific policies privilege uh, what that the academics publish elsewhere as opposed to what they publish within the continent. And that obviously is a transfer of resources which could otherwise have been used uh, to establish a better system of scientific production within the continent. So these are the challenges and we cannot discuss them in isolation. Uh, you know, we cannot start talking about the globalizing publishing culture, uh, but then we leave what is happening in Africa behind. If we have to intervene internally, we have to intervene in a way that first of all builds connections within the continent before those connections are, are, are extended externally. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Bill, can we please go with you next? Sure. Uh, there really are so many roles in, in this system. Um, you have authors, you have reviewers, you have editors, you have publishers, you have librarians, you have researchers, you have um, users of the content. Um, it, it's, it's also um, geographically so diverse, it's worldwide. These disciplines have different needs, different requirements. So I would just suggest that um, we all need to continue talking with each other and to um, talk about common issues and also try to find common solutions. You know, too often in some of the OA discussions, for instance, early on, it was became adversarial with librarians saying publishers were bad and publishers saying that uh, librarians didn't understand um, business needs. And who was left out of this were researchers and, and the students who needed the content. So uh, everything works better when people talk with each other and communicate the different needs and the different um, challenges. And I think that's what I heard today was that there is this willingness to do that. And I, and I welcome that dialogue. Thank you very much, Bill. Uh, Jeroen, last word. Oh, that's too much uh, honor to me, Gerardo. Um, but, but I'll echo Bill's point, uh, but I, I would like to push it a little bit further. Um, I, I understand his comment as okay, continuing to talk to us, everybody around the table, but I would actually make a plea for going back to the drawing table and to reconsider whether the current ecosystem that we have with all these stakeholders involved, as Bill just mentioned, uh, should, be, should be rearranged. Uh, I'm not preaching for a revolution, no, but I would like to really think out of the box and think of alternative models, scenarios that obviously should please all the stakeholders involved, but, but a somewhat broader agenda maybe than, than Bill just addressed. Thank you. Well, thank you all for, for this uh, uh, very, very interesting and deep exchange. Um, I just want to finally echo that precisely this is what we are trying to promote in uh, through our collaboration with the International Association of Universities and the Center for International Higher Education to bring different actors with different perspectives to the table. And we thank you all for being part of this because you all uh, as presenters, as co-organizers, but especially as our audience make this possible. Thank you very much for joining us. And we look forward to having you attending one of the upcoming IAU webinars, as well as some of our upcoming CIHE events. Thank you and have a good afternoon or evening, depending on where you are located. Take care and thank you for joining.